You've heard me say many times before that you need an audiobook for your book. Audiobooks are the fastest growing kind of book. They're the only type of book that's really growing right now. Ebooks and paper books are flat or just a little bit of growth, while audiobooks are still growing double digits every year. And a few episodes ago, I talked about how you can use Hindenburg Narrator to record your own audiobook. But I will say, in general, I only recommend narrating your own audiobook if you write nonfiction. If you write fiction, and if you write nonfiction and don't want to talk on a microphone, it's best to hire a professional narrator who has the skills to make your novel come alive. But this is particularly important for fiction. The more characters you have, the more character voices you have, the more important it is to have a professional narrator. But who do you hire? Where do you even find a narrator? And how do you know if someone is the right narrator for your audiobook? Well, that is what we're going to talk about in this episode of Novel Marketing, the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. I'm Thomas Sumstead Jr., CEO of Author Media, and this is the show for writers who want to build their platform, sell more books, and make a living with writing worth talking about. We have a very special guest on the show today who needs no introduction for many of you. He's the former co-host of this very podcast. He's a best-selling author, a Hall of Fame author, and most importantly for us today, he is a professional audiobook narrator. James L. Rubart, welcome back to the Novel Marketing Podcast. Thomas, e., I've missed being here, so thank you for having me. Well, it's always good to have you get you out of your audiobook recording cave yeah, and get you into right. your podcast recording cave, which is actually separate caves. They are. They are. It's true. <laughs> so I should ask, though, how do I know if I should record my own audiobook or hire a professional? Because you've done both. You've read your own books and you've hired a professional. So when do you do one? When do you do the other? Such a great question. And the analogy I like to use is if you are in your town and you would feel confident going up on stage at the local community theater and performing along with those performers, then great. I think you probably have the mentality and the skill set to do your own book. But if you're going, well, I'm not getting up on stage with those folks, I'd say you really need to consider hiring a professional because essentially you are an actor. Even when you're doing nonfiction, you are an actor when you get behind that microphone and you want to perform at a level where the audience will accept you as a professional. If you don't do that, sorry, but your book sales, audiobook sales are going to suffer. That's right. Because in fiction, you really perform the audiobook yeah. as much as you read it. It's interesting because you're not fully performing the audiobook. There is a kind of production called an audio drama where you tend to bring in more voices and more sound effects. And most books don't do that. Right. Some do, and there's, there's a place for it. The cost for that is typically a lot higher. If you want to hear audio drama done well, anything by Skywalker Sound is the A grade for sound effects and voice acting. So any kind of Star Wars book typically is very, very well produced. And they've been doing it for decades. So when everyone else just hired a narrator, Skywalker Sound was hiring a team of actors to perform Star Wars books. But most authors don't have that kind of budget, and most readers aren't expecting that. In fact, some readers don't like when a story is adapted, because as you bring in more characters, you start to take off text attributions, and sometimes the book gets abridged a little bit to make it work better for narration. And then suddenly it's a different product. <laughs> it's more of an adaption rather than a reading. But I should ask, because a lot of people are like, okay, I know I need a narrator. I know I don't want to do it myself, but I have no idea where to go. So other than authormedia.social, which we do have a job board where you can post to find narrators, but that's probably not the best place. Where would somebody go if they're wanting to get a lot of auditions all at once for their book? Well, I'll use a uh, step back just a second. And a lot of people, when they're first getting into the industry, it's like, well, how do I find an editor? How do I find a great editor? How do I find a great agent? And most of your listeners probably know, Thomas, that, well, go to the back of the books you love and look who the editor was. That's a great place to start. Well, it's the same thing in audiobooks. If you listen to an audiobook and you go, oh my gosh, I love this delivery, that is a great place to start right there. Who do you love in terms of narrating a book? So start there with people you love. The other place to start is ACX, which you've heard a lot about. You can post your job there and have people try out. 
And back to have a lot of people try out. Yes, have a lot of people try out because right now there are a lot of narrators out there. Do not settle for the person you go, hmm, she's pretty good. He's pretty good. Wait until you can find that person that can absolutely nail it. Yeah. And you don't actually have to even buy a book to find out who the narrator was because Audible will show you exactly who the narrator is. You can click on their name, see the other books that they narrate. And this is one of the things to think about when you're hiring a narrator is that narrators have fans. I'm a fan of certain narrators. I really like Kate Redding and Michael Kramer. And if they've narrated a fantasy book, I will buy it just off of that (laughs) because I've enjoyed pretty much every fantasy book that they have narrated. Yeah, Thomas, you bring up such a good point that there's a retail sample. It's from a minute to five minutes long. And so you can get a feel for it without spending a dime of all these narrators until you go, wow, this is the list. I would love to have one of these people narrate it. Another website that's become even more popular than ACX, I would say, recently is Findaway Voices, yep. especially with indie authors. They like Findaway Voices and the flexibility. It's very similar to ACX. It's kind of like Coke and Pepsi or Ford and Chevy. Findaway Voices lets you host an audition just like ACX. Pricing's a little different. The rules are a little bit different. And you can go and check and see which one is the best fit for you. Do you have a preference, Jim, when you're working with clients? use one or the other or both? Which do you prefer? Well, a year ago, it would have been ACX. Now it's find a way. I just did a book and I gave my client the options. I spelled it out here. Here are your options, pros and cons. And he agreed with me that find a way was the way to go. So you're part of the great migration. I am part of the the migration. Well, one of the things with ACX is that you're locked into a seven year exclusivity commitment to Amazon. And that's really restricting. And a lot of authors want to be able to do a Chirp deal. So if you don't know, Chirp is owned by BookBub. It's very similar to BookBub. A really great way to get hundreds or thousands of downloads on your audiobook in one day. And if you're with ACX, that's off the table. You're forbidden from doing a Chirp deal. But if you do a Findaway Voices deal, you can't. So if you go through Findaway Voices, so there's pros and cons. You make a little bit less per book if you go with Findaway Voices. But back to picking narrators, how complicated is it, either through ACX or Findaway Voices, to hire a narrator? Walk us through that process. Essentially, what you want to do is you want to find the best voice for your book. And where that starts is picking an appropriate scene. If it's nonfiction, it's important, but it's not as important. But if it's nonfiction, I would pick a difficult part of the book that's not that easy to get through and see how your narrator handles that. And that might be complicated words if it's a technical book, but make it a tough section of your nonfiction book and see if they can still deliver that in a way that's warm, approachable, and understandable. With fiction, it's a little bit different. I would choose a section where I've got some narration and I've got two or three different characters. I want to see, can they distinguish the voices? If I am hiring for a romance book, for example, And I'm thinking of going with a male to do romance. And you're going, why would I do that? Well, because most of the listeners are female and they like that male voice, right? And we can talk hopefully a little bit later, Thomas, about what type of narrator do you hire for what book and what genre. But I want to see if that guy can do a convincing female voice without making it look sound silly. Or if it's a female, I want to know if she can do a male voice without it being silly. So if I'm doing fiction, I'm going to pick a section where I'm going to stretch that narrator. Yeah, well, well, let's talk about that. When do you pick a man versus a woman to narrate your book? I have narrated all of my own novels except for one. And in that one, the main protagonist, the bulk of the book comes from her point of view. And so it just made sense to hire a female rather than me doing it. So I think you start with that. You have to look at your book, look at the context, look at the feel of it, look at... You're not going to hire a warm, fuzzy narrator for for a thriller, right? And you're not going to hire a thriller reader for a nice, cozy mystery. Although, depending on the adaptability of the actor, maybe you can. Yeah, I think it's all about your protagonist. You match the narrator to the protagonist because depending on what kind of point of view you're writing in, much of the dialogue and the description and kind of the stuff around the dialogue is going to be in that protagonist's voice. And so you want someone to be in their natural voice most of the time where they're in their sweet spot. 
where you're not making them stretch. So if, if you have a female protagonist, you have a male narrator, he's having to stretch into his female voice for most of the book, which can be, one, it's maybe hard on his voice, but two, it's not going to give you as good of a performance necessarily. That said, sometimes there are countervailing factors. Readers won't care much about your narrator unless you change the narrator mid-series, and then suddenly they care very much. And <laughs> you're like, none of you said anything about the narrator before, and now you all want him back or want her back. And it's like, yes, yes, we do. We don't like the new person. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Even if they're better, they're different, and right. that's not what we want. And uh, another example of this, Monster Hunter International books. Most of the books have a male protagonist, but on book six or seven, it was a female protagonist, but they didn't switch, swap out the narrator because the narrator knew the voices for all the characters. And even the other characters that you know were protagonists of a previous book, and now they're a side character in this current book, you still want their voice to be right. <laughs> it's, like, like, it, it's, it's kind of like swapping out actors in a movie or a TV show. Yeah. Back in the day, this, this used to happen all the time where they would just swap the actor and they play the same character. And people don't like that. They, they want the actor to play that character. Yeah, exactly, Thomas. And in first person, you don't want to have a guy doing a first person female character. That that might be kind of obvious, but I probably should just say that. That's just too jarring. In a novel, if it's a first person and it's a female protagonist, you want a female and same with a male. So let's talk money. People are listening and they're like, yeah, but how much does it cost to hire a narrator? Yeah, how much does it cost to buy a car? <laughs> right? <laughs> you can get the Junker car and you can get the Lamborghini and there are many cars in between. And so the first question I want asked or answered is how many books has this person done? If they've done two books, they probably don't have the experience level that I want. I would say 10 books is probably the minimum. Having gone through this period myself, I know I'm way better now that I'm about to start my 27th book than I was when I was starting my 10th book. And so take a look at their history. How many books have they done? What's the variety of books that they've done? The nice thing is you have options. There are three models that you can go through. You can go through a pure royalty where they get 50% of everything you earn for that book forever and ever, amen. But you don't pay anything. So it's no money out of pocket. In exchange, they get 50% forever on whatever comes in. So this is why there's no excuse not to have an audiobook. So you're like, I can't afford an audiobook. It's like, it doesn't actually have to cost you any money. You can get an audiobook for free. And 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. Absolutely. And you could say, you know what? For this one, I'm going 50-50. But you're probably not going to get as good a narrator. But... On your second book, your third book, you're going to do a different model. And so don't discount that idea. Like Thomas says, gosh, it's going to take you a little more work. It's going to take a little more digging. And most of the good narrators are saying, nope, not going to do that because I don't know your sales history. And most of the people that are selling a lot of books are going to go, nope, Jim, we're not sharing 50-50 with you because we know how many books this is going to sell. I've had that situation happen to me. So can you get a good really solid narrator and do the 50-50 and no money out of your pocket. Absolutely, you can. But it's going to take a little more searching to do that. The next model is a hybrid model where they get a certain amount of money for doing it and they get a certain percentage of royalty. And that's somewhat negotiable. And then the final option is per finished hour. So you agree on a per finished hour rate. And then even if it takes them four hours to do one hour of finished audio, which is a pretty realistic example, it's done. You know how much it's going to cost and you keep everything forever and ever. And that's the standard way in the industry. You pay not by how much work the narrator puts in, but by the finished hour. Uh, so narrators have an incentive to read slowly because the slower they read, the more they get paid <laughs> for the book. So give us a range. How much does it cost per finished hour? What's the cheapest you've seen? And then what's uh, the most expensive you've seen? Yeah, I've seen people do it for $50 per finished hour, and that's just insane. That's 500 bucks for a 10-hour book. Yeah, and if anybody is offering you that rate, I would run the other direction because there's no way anybody that's been doing it for a while and has a skill set would do it for 50 bucks an hour. Although somebody's just getting started, they may still do a good job. If you know what to look for, 
But if you've never done it before and they've never done it before, that's a recipe for disaster. But if you're looking for, to save some money, sometimes there are diamonds in the rough if you know how to dig. Yeah, I guess I'd agree with you. But again, you are searching through a lot of rough to find that diamond. And then all the way up to $850 per finished hour I've seen because those are the people that it's, like you said, Thomas, their name on a book is, oh my gosh, this is the narrator. I have an advantage in that people know my name. And so you get that association with my name. And that's I'm just really appreciative of that because some people... Not a ton, but some people do know how I am. So that gives the people an extra bit of publicity. And you can get into the four digits and even five digits. Well, I don't know five digits per hour. Definitely four digits per finished hour if you're working with Hollywood celebrities. So yep. if you want Elijah Woods or James Earl Jones or Patrick Stewart to narrate your book, it gets a little bit expensive as you work your way into A, B, and C list celebrities in that is a totally different process because you're often booking them through their talent agency, mm -hmm. not through Findaway Voices or ACX. But there are celebrity narrators. So they're not a celebrity because they were on such and such TV show. They're a celebrity because they've read 100 books or 200 books all in this one genre. And readers of that genre are used to that person's voice. If you've got a lot of money, you can hire those C-list or B-list actors that are phenomenal voice actors for, if you go, yeah, $1,500 a per finished hour, I can do that. For example, I was listening to a Stephen King book last summer and I thought, oh my gosh, that guy sounds like Will Patton. And I looked it up and sure enough, it was Will Patton. And for those of you who don't know who Will Patton is, he's appeared as a supporting character in a lot of movies. Remember the Titans, if that's a movie you know, he was the assistant coach that coached Boom Bumped Out. And there's Will Patton doing your book. So don't discount that. You could probably get an actor you wouldn't think you could get. And there's a lot of underemployed actors where they did some popular show a long time ago, and they're not doing a lot of acting today. But they've got a good microphone. They've got a studio in their house, and they can record audiobooks. And it becomes a really nice, a reliable source of income for them. So it's a great win-win. And there's a bunch of variety. And a lot of it has to do with what your budget is. And it's better to get an audiobook by a cheap narrator than to not have an audiobook. Because even a cheap narrator is probably going to be better than you. They probably have a better microphone. They know the microphone technique. Hopefully, you're picking one. You do an audition. You are able to find somebody who sounds good. And it's still better to have one. So don't listen to Jim saying, oh, get a good narrator, the best you can afford. If you're like, oh, I can't afford James Earl Jones, so I'm not going to get an audiobook. No, get an audiobook. Because there's a lot of people like me who will not read your book if there's no audiobook version. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some things to look for. You're doing that audition. You've got 12 tryouts, 12 different people reading this tricky part of your book, and they all sound amazing. How do you pick the best one out of those 12? I truly believe that it is show business, not show friendship. On the other hand, I want to work with people I like working with. So I would not do it all via email. If I've got 12 people that I go, wow, they seem really pretty even. What do I do? I'm going to get on the phone and I'm going to chat with them and just go, is there a connection there? Dude, is this somebody I think I can work with? Because there's going to be a lot of back and forth before that thing is done. So I want to know if it's somebody that, yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to enjoy doing this. Thomas? For me, it's not about whether or not they're friends or not. I'm looking at one are they in the industry for a long time? Or are they committed to being in the industry for a long time? So not, I'm not afraid of working with people just getting started. I've hired lots of people just getting started to help them get their career started. But that's something I enjoy doing. But I want to know that you're going to be around, right? If I'm writing the first book in a series, I want to know that you'll be willing to do the subsequent books in the series and you're not just dabbling. And you're like, oh, audiobook narration is not for me and you're going to leave. I don't, I, that's one thing I'm looking for. But I'm also really looking for the performance. I'm looking for crisp, uh, but not sibilant S's, right? I'm looking that they have good microphone technique where they don't have breath sounds, they don't have plosives. And so one piece of advice I would give is invest in some good headphones. I recommend the Audio-Technica ATH M20X headphones. They're around 50 bucks and they're really good. And if you have headphones like that, you'll be able to hear suddenly a lot of differences between good narrators and bad narrators. And because if you're just listening on your iPhone or the speakers built into your laptop, you may not hear the difference. But people listening 
audiobooks, listen on really nice, expensive headphones, right? They're putting in $200 AirPods in their ears. And those $200 AirPods are going to pick up stuff that you're not going to hear listening on bad speakers. That's one advice I would have. And another is listen for accent shifts. So one indication of a rookie narrator is that they can't get the performance consistent on the different characters or the characters start to blend into each other. So I'd listen for that and make sure that they can do a consistent performance. And then one other tip I'd say is make sure in your sample text that you have some of the hardest words to pronounce <laughs> so, uh, in, that are in your book. So if you have a location that's named after an Indian tribe, they need to get that Indian tribe pronounced correctly. <laughs> they need to get that city pronounced correctly because that can really take readers out of the book if they are mispronouncing those key words. Another question I would ask your potential narrator is, how do we work together with changes to the audio? And what I mean by this, there are some narrators that say, you hired me. This is what I produced for you. It's done. And there's other narrators that'll go, sure, I'll change every tiny little thing you want me to change. I think you probably want someone that's in the middle. They'll work with you, but they're also a professional and they know what's going to sound good, probably better than you know what to sound good. But you definitely don't want that prima donna that says, nope, you hired me, you accepted my first 15 minute sample, and you have no input from here on out. So I get really clear on that with them. I would also ask if they are using professional tools like Hindenburg Narrator and Positron, because these are indications that they're professional, right? Are they still recording in free software? Or are they using the kinds of tools where you can easily and quickly give them feedback and where they can easily and quickly make changes? And it's not hard to ask, right? Hindenburg Narrator is a great tool for recording. Positron is like the go-to software for giving feedback. We're able to do your timestamp feedback, that sort of thing. What are some other questions like that that people should ask to be able to tease out who the professionals are? I would go to Audible. I was at a conference earlier this year, and this person was teaching a workshop on how to be an audiobook narrator. And so I went to Audible, and he'd done three books. And I go, hmm, I'm not necessarily sure you're the person to be teaching this class if you only have three books under your belt. And so you might have found somebody, you like them, make sure you go to Audible and you look how many books they've done and listen to each retail sample. Because hopefully what you're going to see there is a variety of voices, a variety of delivery. That's going to fill out to go, okay, she can handle this or he can handle it. So again, back to what I said earlier, this is an important decision. So take your time, really take your time and do do your research. It's all right there. Yeah. So let's walk through the process. So somebody has picked their narrator. They did the audition. They got 12. They got down to three. They got feedback from their Timothy and they picked, they signed the contract. What happens next? So if you're going through a company like ACX, the nice thing about ACX is they help automate the process. In other words, it goes through them. So there is an approval ACX will say, you have approved this narrator. You start the relationship. There's a certain date by which they have to send the first 15 minutes. So now you start to hear, this is actually what it's going to sound like. This is, if your narrator is good, this is something that's, it's not just, oh, let's get this, the 15 done. It's 15 minutes that should be great. This is going to be published when we're all over with. And then at that point, you have a conversation with your narrator. Some people I've worked with, it's like, let me know when it's done, Jim and I'll give you feedback. Other people are like, hey, let me know when each chapter goes up. And so the way I do it is I just develop a Google Drive file where I upload what I call rough MP3s and I let them know ahead of time, these have not been sweetened, they've not been compressed, they've not been mastered, but I'm gonna send those to a file that you can download and listen to and then start giving me feedback. So again, you're gonna work that out with your narrator. Yeah, and I would say lots of feedback early. Don't like sit, they send you chapter one and you don't give them any feedback. Then they send you chapter two, you don't give them any feedback. Then they send you chapter three, you finally listen to chapter one. You're like, oh, this character's name is not pronounced that way. And now you just created a hundred revisions because <laughs> the character is mentioned a hundred times in the book so far in those first three chapters. Don't do that, right? You have lots and lots of feedback on those first few and give it back quickly. Don't be a bottleneck on your own project. And if you give a lot of feedback on those earlier sessions as you get them, you'll find you don't need to give nearly as much feedback on the later sessions because a lot of the stuff is the same thing over and over again. 
And now maybe you're just giving a few performance tweaks, like make this character angry or in this paragraph, that sort of thing. Yeah. I just, just wrapping up a book where it's like, all right, I want you to deliver this, but the guy's got to be, it's a little more humorous. He's chuckling a little bit. He's more laughing inside. So it's that kind of thing. But even stepping back from that, Thomas is exactly right. Give the feedback early so it can be applied to the rest of the book. But one of the things I do is I ask a question up front. I go, all right, well, give me a little more background on this. How do you see this guy being delivered? How do you see this gal being delivered? Because there's so many different ways you can deliver a character. And you do not, as a narrator, you don't want to get 60,000 words in and then say, no, this guy's got a chip on his shoulder, Jim. Oh, gosh, he does. Now, some of that's going to come from the actor interpreting the part. And now we're back to the idea of, wait a minute. You're the script writer and you're telling the actor how to deliver this line. No, no, no. You hired Matthew McConaughey because you know he can deliver this. So it definitely is a collaborative thing. But if your narrator doesn't ask you these questions, I would volunteer them. I'd say, here's how I see the characters being delivered. Here's the background on them. Here's a little bit emotionally where they're coming from. You do this backstory character work when you're developing characters. You're only going to help your narrator if you give them that info. Do you like it when authors send you that? They're like, hey, here's my Scrivener file. I've got all these backstory information about each character. The backstory info is not in the book, but let it inform your performance. And then you know more about where each character comes from. Absolutely. Yes. Love that. <laughs> so this is a great use of all that backstory work, right? Your editor's like, you got to cut these first three chapters. This is backstory. The, the story doesn't start until chapter four. Don't delete those first three chapters. Give them to your narrator. And <laughs> it can help your narrator do a better performance. And I love your idea of have a Zoom call where you talk about each character and talk about how they're different and what they're like. And I imagine in a 15-minute Zoom call, you can get to know the characters really well and really get to know with what the author was trying to do with the character. So maybe right. you can help fill in the gaps. Maybe the writing was a little weak in certain areas, but if you understand what they're trying to do, you can compensate with the performance. I've definitely seen this with children's books. Some of the children's books we have are very good. Some of the children's books we have, not so good. But as a dad, I sometimes can fix it. <laughs> Keep the children's book interesting uh, with a good performance. And so if they know what you're trying to accomplish with the character, how you want the character to feel, the narrator will be able to help you and be your ally. And it's part of the reason why I love audiobooks so much is that when it's done well, the audiobook really is better. Oh, for sure. Because it has this level of interpretation on it that's really fun. Absolutely, Thomas. I agree. Thanks to you, I've turned into an audiobook fiend. I am that now. And that character background. So people often say to me, Jim, how do you keep all these voices straight? Well, Hindenburg actually has a system in it where you can put a little file up there and go, oh, that's how Roy sounds. So you can listen to it. But if you don't want to stop, what I do to keep all the voices straight, here's how I do it. My technique is I embody that character. I just, I take that character on, I see he or she is coming up, and I embody everything I know and everything I feel, and then the voice is just there. And so the more character background I can get, the more authentic it ends up coming off in the final performance. Okay, let's say I'm, I've hired you, okay? So we're going through the book, I'm giving you feedback, you're making changes. Now you've recorded all of the sessions, the, the whole book is recorded and now is it on me to edit those files and get them uploaded to Audible? What happens next? Nope, you don't have to do anything. You give the feedback and a good narrator will take care of it. Now, there are a couple of different ways to go. There are, you can hire a narrator that does everything. They do the editing, they do the mastering, all that. Or you can hire a producer to do some of that for you. I will tell you that I don't do all of the editing. I do the first pass editing. The big stuff that I know is there, like I screwed up a sentence, I'm just cutting that thing out. Or sometimes when I'm editing, I will take a big breath. Well, I can see that on the file. I just clip that out. But then I send it to an editor and she takes care of, she does that edit for me. So she edits me. Then it finally comes back to me. I master it, sweeten the files, do a little compression. It's very stringent. You have to have between 0.0 five and one second at the start of each chapter. You've got to make sure that's right. There's a certain amount at the end. So there's just a lot of little detail stuff that you have to do. I do all that, or your narrator will do all that for you. And then they will upload it. Say, for example, uploading to ACX, ACX will then say, you know what, Jim, this file's too loud, or this one's too soft. Now, Hindenburg has a feature where they can take care of that for you 
But say if you're using Audacity or something like that, that's not necessarily going to happen. So that's a long way of saying you don't have to worry about that. You shouldn't have to worry about all that. Your narrator should take care of all that. They will get the feedback from Findaway. They will get the feedback from ACX to say, yes, these files meet our standards. And the author doesn't interact with your editor. So you send your files to an editor to get sweetened. None of that kind of sweetening is the sort of thing an author would give feedback for. And, and you're not expected, it's like, oh, the EQ is a little bit off on this. You need to bring up the mids a little bit and drop the bass, and put a low pass filter, all that technical stuff. I would say most audiobook narrators probably do those edits themselves. But if they send it and they work with the team, all of that is hidden from the author. So that's complexity you don't need to learn about if you are the author, which is one of the advantages of working with the narrator is that they handle all the technical bits because it's a profession. It's complicated. You have LUFs and DBs and MP3s and compression and two different kinds of compression. You have MP3 compression and audio compression. It's the same word, two totally different things, but they are related a little bit. And as a podcaster, I've had to learn all these <laughs> things <laughs> uh, or I've learned them as, as I go. Uh, you don't have to learn them when you start podcasting. Don't let that scare you off. And I will say, there's a reason why we did an episode on Hindenburg Narrator, and I have not done an episode on Adobe Audition, because if you're narrating audiobooks, Hindenburg Narrator really is the far easier way to do it. So at that point, that you give your final feedback to the narrator, he or she gets it all uploaded, it's now on Audible, and then you, I guess you just pay them, right? And if you're doing it through ACX, you just pay them through ACX, ACX yep. handles the 1099, the taxes, I think Findaway does that as well, right? You don't have to send them any tax forms. All that's handled by Findaway. Yeah. And one more thing I should say, though, with Findaway, a good narrator, if you've never done it before, they can walk you through some of the information that you want to put in because there's going to be metadata and some of those type of things that, that is involved as well. And with Findaway, because it's wide distribution, there's some elements there of where you want it to be distributed. So there are a few details, but again, nothing complicated. You could probably learn it on your own. But if you have a narrator, like I did a book at the end of last year, he had never done one before. So I just walked him through that process. So don't be intimidated by that either. A good narrator will help you through it. And that's one of the advantages of working with a narrator who's done it even once before is that they know the answers to these questions and they can be tech support for you if you're doing find away voices and you're having to do a few of the steps yourself. But metadata, that sounds scary. I have a whole episode on it. We'll link to it in the show notes. But a lot of the metadata is things like name of the author, publication <laughs> right. year, name yeah. of the narrator, like Okay, so you have to type that in, but it's not complicated. Right. <laughs> a lot of it is copying and pasting from the metadata you already did for the ebook version of your book. So don't let that phrase scare you off. And again, you'll have the narrator to help you out. So I should ask before we go, Jim, are you hireable if somebody wants your voice to do their book? Is that possible? Yes, absolutely. I would love to. And the thing I love about audiobooks is you can try out before you buy. So I'd love to read your sample that you send me and see if it makes sense for us to work together. And if they don't pick you, you won't hate them forever, right? You're used to auditioning. Every actor gets gigs and loses gigs. So it's not personal. <laughs> not at all. There, I like a lot of different styles of music, Thomas. It, <laughs> and when I put on one style, it doesn't mean I don't like the other. If you want to connect with Jim about potentially narrating your audiobook, you can find him at secondmilestudios.com. That's secondmilestudios.com. Our featured patron is Jennifer Lamont Leo, author of The Rose Keeper. During the Great Depression, a spoiled socialite must suddenly find a way to support herself and her child. Can she turn a homemade recipe for skin tonic into a livelihood? Find out in The Rose Keeper. Jennifer Lamont Leo, thank you so much for being a patron of the podcast. So, Jim, any final tips or encouragement? One more thing to think about. If you're saying, I want to do the book myself, it's a memoir and I can't imagine anyone else doing it. Yes, it is a lot of work to become proficient at this. But if you're determined, don't let this conversation dissuade you. I say, do it. I say, go for it. You can become a really good narrator. Well said. If you're feeling lonely in this publishing walk and you want some authors to come around you, I would encourage you to check out authormedia.social if you haven't already. This is a free social network that I built. You may even see James L. Rubart 
on there. <laughs> it's a place where you can discuss episodes of this podcast, but we also have sections on platform and publishing. If you are stuck in any publishing process and you have a, a question, I've been really pleased and surprised at how quick good answers get posted. If you're tired of getting bad advice on Facebook groups or conflicting advice on Facebook groups and you're wondering where the cool authors hang out, where the successful authors hang out, I'll tell you, they hang out at authormedia.social. That's www.authormedia.social. The Novel Marketing Podcast is a production of Author Media. Our producer is Lori Christine. This episode's audio was edited by William Umstead using Hindenburg. And the blog post version is crafted by Shauna Lettler. To read the blog post version of this episode, go to authormedia.com slash 336. I'm Thomas Umstead Jr. joined by James L. Rubart saying thank you for listening and live long and prosper.